Hello, and welcome to Making the Round, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Today's episode is part of our Health IT series from the AMA MSS Committee on Health Information Technology. I'm one of your hosts, Christopher Jackson, a medical student at the University of Toledo College of Medicine. Today's guest is Dr. Catherine Rubino, an intellectual property lawyer at Caldwell Intellectual Property Law and chair-elect of the Chemistry and Law Division of the American Chemical Society. Dr. Rubino received her doctorate of pharmacy from Northeastern University and her Juris Doctorate from Suffolk University School of Law. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Rubino. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so for our first question, we just want to know, how are you involved in the health IT space and what are you currently working on? I know some of that's gonna be a little shrouded in mystery, but just a general idea of how you do work in that space. Sure, absolutely. So I am based in Boston and I work with a lot of um, startups and companies in the healthcare and health tech space. And I think certainly our approximation to so many universities um, in the greater Boston area and kind of being at this tech center really enables us to work with a lot of companies working um, on some really cutting edge projects and doing a lot of really interesting things in the healthcare space. I'd say probably over the last few years, the biggest trends and areas of innovation that we're seeing is certainly um, the intersection of healthcare with uh, fields like blockchain for patient data, cybersecurity, HIPAA compliance, and also we're seeing a lot of kind of artificial intelligence, machine learning, informing healthcare. Um, and also just, um, you know, startups looking to uh, solve complex problems using some of these new technologies like using AI to source new drugs or target new molecules, things of that nature. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And what do you think is the impact of your work on the health IT space and what challenges have you experienced? I'd say certainly the impact of our work is to really work with our clients one-on-one -on -one to create intellectual property strategies for them that align with their business objectives, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there that a lot of people think, oh, like I just need to go get a patent. And we really try to educate our clients and work with them from the beginning to understand that, number one, do they need a patent? And number two, if they do wanna get a patent, how is this gonna add value to their business and help them maybe um, achieve some kind of business objective down the road, whether that's through, you know, licensing the patent to maybe somebody else in the field, using the patent to create some joint collaborations, or just really in the beginning, maybe just um, boxing out others from entering their space, making sure that things they're coming up with and what they're working on, really, um, they can take ownership of that. And I think certainly in the healthcare industry, it can get a little bit muddied waters if you're working for a big institution um, that might have their own IP policy, like a hospital or academic research center, and you develop something maybe using patient data while you're at the hospital, who owns that IP, helping sort out, navigate those types of issues um, can be really helpful. And also, uh, we just really like to also kind of give back and educate the entrepreneur community. And um, we do some work with the MIT Sandbox uh, Fund. It's a private innovation fund at MIT to provide pro bono office hours to answer uh, legal issues for startup teams spinning out of the university. Because I think there's also a lot of complex IP issues that present. If you're leaving an academic institution, you know, do you need to go negotiate something with the TLO or do you own the IP outright? So helping kind of navigate challenging waters and um, create a plan moving forward. Okay, uh, and just to follow up on that, if I'm a physician and I come up with a interesting new health IT thing or a modification to the EMR or something like that, when should I read out, reach out to a patent attorney? What is the appropriate time to do that? Uh, that's a great question. So I'd say the number one thing everybody in academia wants to do is publish or talk about their work, right? Yeah. 
And when people tell me that my hair starts to turn gray because um, in the United States, you have one year from your first public disclosure to file a patent on that innovation or you lose all your rights. So you want to think about talking with an attorney sooner rather than later, because if you go give this presentation and you don't follow up for three years, you will have um, unwillingly waived your rights to get a patent. And if you want to seek patent protection abroad in other jurisdictions, for example, in Europe, a public disclosure automatically bars you from doing that. So really, you want to think about this sooner rather than later and not put this off if possible. Okay. Um, and another question that I'm sure is on the top of everyone's mind, how has COVID affected your work? I'm sure it's affected everyone's work to some degree, but which is Absolutely. Um, I think what's been really interesting about COVID is that we've seen an explosion of innovation. We've seen innovations come out of necessity. And um, I think what's been really neat is just being able to work with a lot of these innovators on some really interesting aspects of the COVID pandemic. We've had clients um, who've created vaccines, who've been involved in COVID testing procedures, and getting to learn about their business and see how they're really trying to help and give back to the community has been really transformative. Um, and I'd say the other interesting part of this is also I think just getting more comfortable with video conferencing and doing everything over video um, before the pandemic. I used to really like meeting with clients in person and having just great conversations one-on-one. -on -one. And now it's more, you know, being comfortable doing, having some of these in-depth conversations over video and kind of transforming the way we work where you can now talk to anybody anywhere in the world instantaneously. Um, whereas I think before there was maybe some hesitancy or we relied on more in-person meetings, but just really kind of incorporating virtual activities. And I think that's something here to stay. I don't think it's gonna go away once the pandemic has kind of uh, resolved. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. Um, and just to kind of follow up on that, what else do you think is going to stick around from the pandemic other than just the ubiquity of the video conferences? Is there anything else in the space that you think is going to be here for the long haul? Absolutely. I think probably the biggest trend we've seen over the past year in the health tech space is telemedicine, right? Because now we there was this major unwillingness to be able to bill for providers, to be able to bill for telemedicine services from Medicare and Medicaid. And now we're seeing that's totally shifted tune. And I think too, we're also seeing um, home delivery of healthcare where maybe there's ways we can interact with our doctor through say data we collect at home about ourselves with like wearable watches um, or just even uh, fitness trackers, things of that nature. And we can really inform our doctor from the safety of our own home without having to go see them in person. And I think that kind of this trend towards um, custom medicines where we're, it's not a one size fits all approach. We're able to gather so much data about ourselves that we can really tailor and figure out what's wrong with people. Um, based on information we know about them. And that's, I think, certainly been a huge driver over the past year. Okay. Um, and in 10 or 15 years, and fingers crossed for 10, um, when I'm a practicing physician, what do you think will be the issues that we're facing in the health IT space? And how do you think things will have changed by that point? Okay. Well, I'd say probably the biggest 
issue in 10 years is going to be electronic medical records, right? Because this is so, sort of a new um, thing that's the healthcare community has kind of been hesitant to adapt. And I think the lack of a uniform um, electronic health record system where hospitals can't always interact with other hospitals or other hospitals have their own records or use, you know, Epic or something and others don't, I think that poses a real problem if we want to be able to streamline medical services and um, be able to know so much more information about patients, because a lot of times patients maybe get treated at different hospitals and being able to have access to all those records or have them in one central spot, I think will be very key. Um, and I'd say also hopefully in 10 years to maybe the insurance problem about reimbursement, how to bill insurance, hopefully maybe that problem will be solved too, but I'm not, I'm not too confident on that one. Um, and before we wrap up, um, are there any channels where people can reach out to you and interact with you and follow your work if they would like to? Absolutely, yes. If you go to our firm website, uh, www.caldwellip.com, we post um, news stories and events every um, week, and you can sign up for our email blast, and we are always trying to uh, post interesting stories about intellectual property in the healthcare space that it might be of interest to people. Okay. Well, that's all for today. Thank you, Dr. Rubino. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening today. This has been Making the Rounds, a podcast by the American Medical Association. You can subscribe to Making the Rounds and other great AMA podcasts wherever you listen to yours or visit ama-assn.org slash podcast. Thank you for listening.